I'm Chris Carter of the Locked On Steelers podcast. Let's finally talk about the offensive linemen in this NFL draft class, especially now that the combine is done. We'll do that. Talk about sweet spots in this NFL draft class with that 17th pick and mock draft Monday winner right here. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things on the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on your favorite podcasting app and as well as on YouTube. Like this video if you see see it on YouTube. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day because we're your team every day. Now, the NFL Combine is over. I am not back home yet. As if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that. I'm on the road on my way to Greensboro, North Carolina. I'll be there covering the ACC basketball tournament, especially the Pitt Panthers, as they earn the five seed in the tournament. And we'll be playing to see if they can solidify their resume as an NCAA tournament team. But you're not here to listen about Pitt basketball. You can do that at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, where I work with Noah Hiles. We'll be covering that exclusively there. But we can talk about this, this combine, which I was at. Now, I had to leave before the offensive line tested, but of course, we, we all saw that. And it kind of led me to down the track of where I see this offensive line class. And I see it kind of similarly to how we talked about the, the, the cornerback class. And we talked with Mike DeFable of the athletic on Friday. And it's that you're probably going to miss out on a good, good first, like one, a crop of the class, but you're still going to get a really good crack at a lot of good players. Even the 17th pick, even with the 32nd pick, even with the 49th pick, maybe even the 80th pick if you want to go that far. But I think when we're looking at this class, we're looking we're looking at a few things. One, there's three guys who have universally seemed to be accepted as the top of the class. One is Paris Johnson Jr. of Ohio State. Another is Peter Skorinski of uh, Northwestern. And another is Broderick Jones of Georgia. Now, the, there were Paris Johnson Jr. from Ohio State was kind of being looked at as this guy who you know he had the prototypical build, six five, you know, a little taller than six five, big, you know, plays the position, looks physical, looks the part. But Peter Skaronsky was the guy who looked the most technical. He looked the most sound in understanding how to do his job. Looked quick, but he lacked the length. Broderick Jones looked like he was the nastiest of the of the top three out of Georgia and he was able and but but his length was also in question too it was thought that he was 6 foot 4 his arm might have been a little short and that he wasn't going to have all the tools necessarily to be ready in the NFL to just just be jumped in and put in at offensive tackle to start but i think that we got some more answers to this draft class Paris Johnson Jr was fine Broderick Jones and Peter Skorinski i think did enough to boost their stock to be like hey we're not just first round picks were high first round picks. Peter Skronsky tested very well when you look at the, when you look at the combine. Um, just looking at at how at how he was able to move, he had the second best broad broad jump of the of the offensive line, uh, which again shows explosiveness. He had the second highest vertical jump when it came to that. He also had the um, uh, he, he was he, he was also just he was also pretty pretty solid when you did the on field drills and you saw him getting up and moving. Um, uh, so when you see those type of things and the explosiveness that Peter Skorinski has, I really like the way that he that he plays when I've seen the tape that, I, that I've seen because he uses his feet a lot. And he talked about that at the podium when he was at the combine. He talk, Peter Skorinski talked about how he was how he was able to use his feet to keep repositioning, to keep winning leverage battles. The one thing that everyone's looking at, though, is the fact that he's a little under six foot five and a little under 30. I think it's 34 inches or no, 35 inches. That uh that you're supposed to be at if uh in your wingspan and that's where I think that there were some concerns about um about about uh, Peter Skaronsky because if he was if he was six six and he had like a forty inch wingspan he'd be a top ten pick easy we'd be talking about him like we were talking about some of the you know some of the bigger guy, guys out there but. Peter Skaronsky, I, I look at I look at that, and I think that a lot of teams are going to see the, the technique that he brings, the athleticism that he brings, the explosiveness that he brings, and even if he's not a fit at offensive tackle, he's going to be a, he's going to be a fit somewhere in the offensive line, and he's 
going to be a very good one. And I think that he, he even said, uh, you know, he's more than willing to put himself out there to be like, hey, I'll switch to guard. I'll switch to whatever you want. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, so it's 34 inches, inches on the wingspan. But here's the thing. Broderick Jones did meet those me measurements. He was actually measured a little over six foot five and, uh, when he was at the combine, despite being listed at six foot four uh, when he was when he was at Georgia. Uh, he also posted the best 40, 40 yard dash time. He looked really good in the broad and vertical jumps, um, and he was he was just over that thirty four inch uh, arm wingspan that that, that everyone's that everyone's looking for because again the whole point of offensive tackle the reason we're talking about size so much there is because that's a huge part of the weapon that that offensive tackles use to win out on the edge because edge rushers you want them to take the furthest pass around so you want if you're an offensive tackle you want your arms to be long enough that you're able to punch get control and put and, and push back or punch and keep them away from your frame and those are things that I think that I think come. There's plenty of guys that that find ways to win without the longest wingspan or anything like that. But it helps to have it when you're looking at raw players and you're looking at NFL draft prospects because this is a box that you can just have checked in your favor. I still think Peter Skaronsky is actually probably going to be the first offensive lineman drafted in this draft class. But when I look at these other guys, I think that Broderick Jones with the way that he performed in Paris Johnson's pedigree already, I think all three of these guys – go off the board before the Steelers pick. And that could present, you know, maybe some frustration from Steelers fans. Like, well, why didn't we just lose out so we can get off these offensive tackles? But again, I think this is a pretty good offensive tackle class. Um, I've talked about this a lot, but there's a lot of guys in this draft class like Anton Harrison of Oklahoma, Darnell Wright of Tennessee, Matthew Bergeron of, of uh, Syracuse. All of those guys, I think, are guys that if they if the Steelers pick them at 32 or 49, even great value for what they're trying to do, and great a, a great opportunity. And I think that these are, these these would be guys who you could plug in. They could battle with with Dan Moore Jr. and potentially be your starting left tackle for the future and develop into a, a really useful part of the team. That's where. I think the Steelers are looking to make make their move here in the NFL draft, especially with the offensive line. It doesn't have to be 17th overall. But again, I think it's going to be tricky. It's always tricky to go and find who is going to fall to you. Who is going to be who is going to who are what's, what's going to be the position that does fall to you? It's something that Wes Euler brings up from Steeler Nation Radio always on this show when we bring them on. We're talking about the NFL draft. The Steelers never dreamed that cam hayward would fall all the way down to 31 they thought he was a top 15 pick easy and at defend as a defensive lineman and we see why they thought that because of how he's played over his career for the steelers but maybe there's an offensive lineman or another position where a guy falls that far and the steelers are happy to take them at 17 that's going to be a question i think that the steelers can answer uh as as time goes on but I want to take a closer look at what I think can be the sweet spots of this of this NFL draft class because I do think that with this with this combine we saw some really good performances that raised guys stocks and it might have shifted where certain guys who we thought might be late first round picks might be early first round picks and maybe that gives a glimpse into what positions we could still be staring at if we're looking at the Steelers needs and matching them up with the best talents that will be there and available. We'll talk about all that in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, so don't go anywhere. But first, I'd like to tell you guys about Built Bar. Built Bar, of course, is the number one protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. And Built Bar is amazing because it's covered in 100% real chocolate, and it comes in so many different flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, double chocolate brownie cup, uh, coconut almond. There's so many different flavors to try. And again, they're all great for you. They're only packing 130 calories. They're only packing 4 grams of sugar, and you're getting 17 grams of protein. So you're getting your gains without all the, the stuff that you're trying to avoid if you're trying to eat right. And again, these th things taste good. Great. So go get them right now. And you don't have to go to built.com to order them to your door anymore. You can go right to your local Walmart or Sam's Club and pick them up today. If you go to a local Walmart, just head to the pharmacy section, pick up a four, four bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, uh, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. Or if you go to Sam's Club, grab a 13 bar box of brownie batters or churro. Trust me, when you try Built Bar, you'll thank me later because Built Bars are the best protein bars out there because they taste like a candy bar and they're good for you too.
back here in the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We're continuing the show here. Again, I'm on the road, so I apologize for me not being in my surroundings. We'll be on the road again probably until next week's shows, but it's still going to be fine. We're still going to have a lot of great content. We'll have guests on all throughout the week. But I wanted to talk more about uh, the sweet spots that I was talking about in this draft class because I was going through, and I always try to, wherever the Steelers pick, I always try to guess around my estimate of which positions get the runs that run the, that position off the board to the point where you don't even want to worry about it. And there's also positions where the Steelers don't have to worry about them in the first place because they're not looking for it. Like, for example, running back. But John Robinson looks amazing, but they're not taking a running back, uh, you know, unless it's like the seventh round. Um, and even then, I think that, that they don't need to with the guys that they have, especially in Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. So that being said, I think the Steelers are in a great position right now to, uh, to to look at this. And you can see, especially this year, people were talking about how well Anthony Richardson tested. Steelers fans need to root for that guy to stock to continue to rise, as well as Will Levis, because we all know Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud are the top two quarterbacks. And, I mean, heck, we, I talked about on the show last year saying, hey, the Steelers don't need to rush to get a quarterback or trade up to get a quarterback if Kenny Pickett's not there at 20. You can get your quarterback next year. Well, Kenny Pickett was there at twenty, so we don't have to we don't have to worry about that this year. But those two guys we know are going. Will Levis is being talked about like that. He's going to be in that group as well. And Anthony Richardson was the was the wild card quarterback who maybe weren't sure about because he didn't have all the stats and everything. And that's where uh, I think that um, I think that you know there there were some questions there. You know, what could he put it all together? And then he had a fantastic combine. He was jumping off the roof. He was running fast. He was doing everything you want. Super athlete at the combine. So now people are talking about him like, oh, no, he's a top 10 pick. Either way, if we're talking four quarterback picks in the first 16 picks of the draft, you're now down to just 12 picks that you need to worry about as far as what the what will be out of the way when the Steelers come there, at, come there at 17. And again, I'm expecting the Steelers to not trade up. I just don't think it makes sense for how many needs that they have to fill in their roster this year. I think that there's a ton of value in the guys that are that can come on day two. I don't think that they need to necessarily trade those picks away. But let's just look for a minute at the guys who are who, who I do think aren't gonna aren't gonna be there. So we talk about the four quarterbacks. I'm gonna throw in all three offensive tackles because I just think Broderick Jones, Paris Johnson, Peter Skaronsky, all of those guys are really talented offensive tackles, offensive line runner premium. They're gonna get drafted. So now we're talking seven players we're estimating there. I can see about three edge rushers going. We all know Will Anderson's going top five. Ty Tyree Wilson could also go top five out of Texas Tech. And Miles Murphy is a guy that seems to a lot of people still think could still also be in that range. So now we're talking four, three, and three. So now we're up to 10 players where uh, you only need to account for six more there. You're obviously going to account for Jalen Carter. I'd even throw Brian Brze out of Clemson in there. So now you're talking 12 players. Now you're just looking for four more spots and where those would go. I haven't even talked about wide receivers and corners yet. And Christian Gonzalez, Devin Witherspoon, I think they could be there. I think Joey Porter Jr. could possibly be there. But that's where I think the split could be interesting because just based off of looking at team needs like Washington, um, you know, like the Patriots, like the Jets, uh, like the Packers, what's going to be more valuable to them? Is it going to be a corner? Is it going to be a safety like Brian Branch? Is it going to be a wide receiver? I looked at it in, and I look at it and I say it could be a mix of four guys that go corner and wide receiver in either direction. I think it, you're I think you'd be more likely to get three corners than three receivers in that in the top 16 with this draft class. So I'd even lean to saying three corners and one receiver, but I could also see two receivers sneaking up in there if someone was really high on Jackson Smith and Jigba because he did very well and Quentin Johnson I think is going to be the top wide receiver pick of this draft class. So all that being said, after you do all the math and and value on all those other guys, now you're at pick 17. Again, four quarterbacks off the board, three edges off the board, two interior defensive linemen, two corners. We'll say two receivers, three offensive tackles. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, and so there, there you have it. So then your positions of strength, then you look at it. If, if only two corners are off the board, and even if three corners are off the board, corner still brings really good value. And we'll talk about some of the guys. Deontay Banks, I thought, tested out of this world. And 
I like Deontay Banks' style of play at Maryland. He was aggressive. He's a press corner. He's physical. He loves to be physical. But I was worried that if he wasn't that fast, if he was, if he had like, you know, just around like four, five, four, four, nine speed, that his aggressive style of play was going to get him burnt and it was just going to be it. And he was not going to have the speed to kind of keep up with guys for playing at that, at that athletic level. No, he was one of the best testing players at the combine when it comes to the quarterback cornerback position. So he's a guy that I think would be there at 17 by at all costs. And I think that that'd be a, that'd be a great you know spot for the Steelers to maybe look at, look at him there, but also I'd be intrigued to see other, other guys that they could, that they could grab there. Um, I think that there's still interior defensive linemen that you, that you could be looking at there. I think the edge is still an option there. Um, you know, Lucas Van Ness is a guy who I've talked about before on this show. I think that he's one of those guys that didn't fully refine his game at Iowa, a lot like how TJ Watt didn't really refine his game at Wisconsin. Very talented, the right build. Obviously, obviously, a guy who seems to have a, has a good head on his shoulders. Seems very coachable with all the notes that we've heard and all the thing, all the things that have been said about him. He also he also didn't start at you know a whole bunch for Iowa, so he's a guy I think that you could work at and a lot like how T.J. Watt came into the Steelers. He was very strong, very explosive, and very you know he wanted to learn, but he didn't have a ton of pass pass rush moves in his repertoire, and that was something the Steelers taught him. And eventually, he became T.J. Watt. I'm not saying Lucas Van Ness is going to become T.J. Watt, but I think that there's upside where he tested very well. He has the right build. There's a lot of traits that people like of him on tape. I like him on tape, and I think that he's a guy the Steelers could be looking at as far as a potential, you know, guy who could be a tweener between edge and defensive line in the five technique and the three technique. And that's where I think the Steelers, you know, could be could be looking at here is that defensive line class because we're also talking about Lucas Van Ness. I loved that the fact that Kalaja Kansi ran a really good 40 yard dash time. Now, 40 yard dash times for defensive tackles are basically useless, but it shows his athleticism and it shows the part of Kalaja Kansi that I've been talking about for years. That guy is quick, electric, explosive. He gets off the ball, he shoots between gaps. If you're a step slow, he's going to find a way to beat you because of it. That's why I, I think Kalaja Kansi is really good. But my clash with Kalaja Kansi and the Steelers. Is, is Kalaja Kansi at 17, is he a traditional Steelers defensive lineman in the sense that the Steelers like to get guys, you look at their, 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 their line and how they've been built, the look that they were going for through most of the 2010s was Cam Hayward and Stephon Tewitt, two six foot five, six foot six, six behemoths who were extremely good athletes who could move, pass, rush, win the run, do those types of things. Kalaja Kansi measured at six foot one. Good, good. That, that, that that's fine, but still not the kind of six foot five height that they're looking that they're typically looking for. And I'm just not so sure the Steelers make that leap leap, leap, leap to get Kalijah at 17. But maybe they trade back, and maybe there's a sweet spot there to consider to consider for Kalijah Kansi because I think that he could be a talented defensive lineman as part of a rotation, and I think that he'd still he'd be someone the Steelers should look at. But there's a lot of guys they should look at. And I think, again, when we're talking about sweet spots, I think defensive line, you could also look at corner. You know, if Joey Porter Jr. is still on the board, he's going to be there. Deontay Banks, he's, he, I think he could be there. I think Joey Porter Jr., again, I think he is off the board before the Steelers get there. But if he is, it adds to the pot there. Um, you know, I think edge could be a really interesting position there, even though we're talking about how T.J. Watt, I think they should re-sign Alex Highsmith. And I also said that maybe they should look into Bud Dupree. If a, if a top flight edge rusher is there, uh, like Nolan, say Nolan Smith sitting there with how explosive that guy looked, and all the other prospects are there, and, you're, and you don't find a trade down option, maybe go get that guy because maybe he is the next big thing in edge rusher. And as we've seen Andy Weidel do for the Philadelphia Eagles, it's smart to amass more pass rushers, keep pass rushers coming, so that you have a constant flow of attacking the quarterback all throughout the game. It doesn't slow down, and then when you're in the fourth quarter, you got fresh uh, a fresh set of two different sets of pass rushers instead of just your top guys that you're hoping to get in there for the big play. So lots of angles to go for there. And I talked about trading down there, maybe if to get to get a guy like a Kalaja Kansi or maybe a Nolan Smith based off of how they played there. That was the challenge that I gave to you guys with mock draft. Monday. So we thank everyone that submitted Mock Draft Mondays, and we have a winner that we're going to, to go over their picks in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Again, I'm your host, Chris Carter. Stick with us. We'll be right back going over the, the winner for Mock Draft Monday.
back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Now, Mock Draft Monday, I'm going to do this a little different this year. Last year, I was just every week, just submit your, submit your picks. This is it. This is it. Bing, bang, boom. There's all your picks out there. We have fun with that. But this year, we're going to do some different challenges. We're going to do some different exercises to get some things out here. And so the first two Mock Draft Mondays we did, just straight up, just pick them. I'll look at them, whatever I think you know works and get some interesting conversations for the show. That's what we'll go with. But this weekend, I challenged you guys both on Twitter and on our Locked on Steelers Facebook page to go in and give your best shot to trade back from the 17th pick to get a lower pick uh, with with that and amass more day two picks and then see show me what you can get with your different mock draft simulators. So we did just that. A lot of you submitted. We had, we had, we had over 100 people submit their, their picks. We thank you, everyone, for participating. But time has come to reveal this week's winner, and it is Stephen Hagarth. Congratulations, Stephen. You had a really interesting set of picks here that even line up with what I'm talking about today on this show. Steven tr- traded with the Seahawks, get, giving giving up the 17th overall pick to just move back three draft picks to get the 20th overall pick. And in doing so, he, he added on the, a, uh, the third round pick at 83rd overall. So that is now in that situation because he's done that. That is four day two picks, which is, again, I think a sweet spot in this NFL draft class as far as who the Steelers could get, what they could contribute, and and finding guys that if again if they get hit on their first round pick and hit on just three of those four guys that you're talking about in the second round, you're then saying you got four starters in one draft class and guys that could be developing really quickly. That's going to be interesting. So that was the trade. And who did he get with his first round pick with that moving back to the twentieth overall? Guy was just talking about Deontay Banks. Steven, I like Deontay Banks. I liked his tape. I wanted to see like how he tested at the combine because I wanted to just compare and contrast him to all the other cornerbacks out there. And my goodness, did he impress again? Just going over hit, going over his numbers. Uh, he had the third best forty yard dash at four point three five seconds. So obviously he can scoop. Um, then he had the highest vertical jump at forty two inches. Um, he had the uh, the second longest broad jump at 11 feet and four inches. Um, so, uh, and actually, sorry, I read that wrong. I think it was 42 feet. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, um, but yeah, either way, he had the best vertical, the second longest broad jump, and the third fastest 40 yard dash. Deontay Banks looked good. And I think that if he continues to look good in his pro day, has some good meetings with with the coaches, he could be a guy. We all know Mike Tomlin. He's been a Maryland dude he's from that area. Son went to Maryland for a little bit. Maybe he has his fingers in that area and he wants to look at some Deontay Banks. But still need to get offensive tackle addressed. And Steven, my man, did that by getting Anton Harrison offensive tackle out of Oklahoma. I like Anton Harrison in this spot. I'm not so sure about 17. But when I look at his, at his skill – at his skill set, I think he's a guy that can plug in. He could bring a, a real quick challenge for Dan Moore Jr. and be saying, okay, let's see what you've got. And if he can put it together, maybe he's the blindside protector for Kenny Pickett. Maybe he built that connection with, uh, with, with Kevin Dotson, and you're moving forward on a positive pace there. Then I think that you did something really cool here, Steven, and you got a guy that had a great combine, and that's Jack Campbell, the linebacker out of Iowa. Now, if you haven't been paying attention – to the combine you might have missed out on you know how some of the things tested out now linebackers i thought were interesting trenton simpson ran really well 4.43 so he's really fast and explosive and i think that that's that's great to see but man there was some, there was a uh, jack campbell came to play in all the other events his 40 was i think a 4.85 that's fine he doesn't need to necessarily run that fast uh because he's explosive as all get out a 37.5 inch uh ver- ver- vertical jump he had a uh um a, a 10 foot eight inch broad jump which shows again shows his ex- his explosiveness then in the three cone, he had the best time at 6.74 seconds, um, showing his ability to be uh, his, his agility. And then he also had the best 20 yard shuttle at 4.24 seconds of this linebacker class. Granted, this linebacker class isn't exactly boasting, you know, a bunch of Ryan Chazier's and superstar guys, but he looked to be the kind of guy that you could put in the middle of the part of the field. The tape I've seen, I like some of his cover skills that he's shown. He has the ability to change direction and get moving. 
I think that him in the, at 49 overall, especially if you've addressed corner and tackle, would be a great spot to get your linebacker, especially if it's Jack Campbell. And then – what I really, again, what I really liked about Stevens' picks here is he went after all the Steelers' needs. He goes and gets Keanu Benton, the Wisconsin interior defensive lineman, who I've been praising ever since his senior bowl week. I thought he had a great week of practices. He showed up. He showed out. I talked to him at the combine. He was, he seemed like he was really focused in on trying to just get better every day. I think he has the right head on his shoulders. I like Keanu Benton. And I think that he's going to be a physical interior defensive line presence and a guy that you could plug in, learn behind Cam Hayward, learn how to play, play with DeMarvin Leal. And and bing, bang, boom, you might eventually have the, the defensive lineman group crew of the future brewing right there onto the Steelers. Then with the extra pick that Steven got from the Seahawks in the trade at 83rd overall, he goes and gets USC guard Andrew Voorhees. Uh, you know, I'm kind of here and there about Voorhees. I haven't studied him that much, so I won't pretend like I'm some expert on him. But uh, I think that still getting interior offensive line help. Uh, is going to be big in this draft class. You want to get, at least get some, because even if they don't take a spot off of Mason Cole, James Daniels, or Kevin Dotson, hint, hint, I think it, if, if anybody, it would be Kevin Dotson, because those other two guys I think were much more consistent last year. But even if a Voorhees doesn't come in and take over that spot, if he can just be the best interior for offensive line option off the bench when someone gets hurt, because again, the Steelers were very fortunate to not have anyone get hurt on the offensive line and miss and have to miss a start this year. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't think that's going to repeat this year and they need to find guys like that. So Voorhees with that extra third round pick, I think is a very good look there. Then Jair Brown safety out of, out of Penn state with that, with that 120th pick Jair Brown, I think could be a guy that you work into the system and see how he does. I liked some of the, his, his things on tape, but uh, he did not have a good combine at all. His stock has definitely dropped. If you brought him in, maybe have him compete with Trey Norwood, see what happens there at safety and go from there. Then for the seventh round picks, you got Yaya Diaby, uh, edge rusher out of Louisville. I think that that's a solid pick in the seventh round. He's, an, he's a good athlete. I think he's going to he'll, he'll give you another option on the edge to compete with the likes of Jameer Jones and Quincy Roche, who the Steelers have brought back. And then you get receiver Trey Tucker out of Cincinnati in the seventh round, because why not? You can always just grab a receiver. And who knows? Maybe he's the next Antonio Brown because the Steelers just pick – wide receivers, whatever they want, and turn them into superstars. Anyways, all that being said, I think that this is a very good draft class from Stephen, from Stephen Hayward. And I thank you guys all for participating in Mock Draft Monday. You were, I'm going to do my first full round one mock soon. I can't promise it yes to, for tomorrow because I have to travel and keep things going and getting to the ACC tournament. But very soon, I'll probably have my full first round mock of where I expect teams to go after the combine. And then we'll also do my, my second uh, full mock for the Steelers of seven rounds soon. And we'll start talking about that, but beyond mocks, we're going to have a lot of analysts come in. We're going to be talking with other guests about what they thought of the combine, who excelled, who didn't, and who should really be on the Steelers radar for the different picks of the different rounds. Thanks again for everyone who checks out the locked on Steelers podcast. Again, I'm your host, Chris Carter. You can follow me on Instagram and, uh, and, and Twitter at Carter Critiques. If you're checking out this show on uh, on YouTube, please like the video, subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, uh, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Lockdown Steelers podcast your first listen every day. Um, and re remember, if you want to help out the show even further, go on Apple Podcasts, uh, rate us five stars with a positive comment. You do both at the same time, and you get a special shout out at the end of the show. And we get this person here on who gave us a five-star review recently. And that's Parkman134 with a five-star rating saying, amazing podcast. Love the work you do, Chris. All the intel you give us and your thoughts and picks. Love being part of the official offseason. Hashtag Steel Nations. Thank you very much, Parkman134. Appreciate everyone who gives us gives us a five-star rating on Apple. You can get your shout-out by giving leaving your rating and review. Thanks again. Again, I'm Chris Carter, Locked On Steelers Podcast. I'll find you guys tomorrow when I've gotten to my next place that I'm staying on my big road trip here, but we'll be keeping it going right here on the Locked On Steelers Podcast. Stay tuned for all your Steelers news and takes.